Taiwanese were very successful at reacting to change in the tea markets. Why? I think to understand this, we want to look at the structure of the tea industry in Taiwan. And this industrial structure is similar to the structures of a lot of the successful industries that we're going to look at later in Taiwan. On the one hand, there's not much vertical integration. The tea went through the hands of many different business people, okay, many independent business people. On the other hand, there's not much horizontal integration. They're mainly small and medium enterprises, and what we call SMEs, and actually in Taiwan's case, we should probably call these SEs. Okay, most of them are not even medium enterprises. They're very much small enterprises. The only exceptions here would be some of the, the Japanese investments in, in black tea production. And that, that, was, that was exceptional. Okay, but in Taiwan, first the tea had to be produced by farmers. One thing you notice about farmers in Taiwan is that generally, there are some exceptions, but generally they didn't specialize in tea. Most of the farmers that grew tea grew other things. And you can, you can tell this by looking at the, the land contracts I've talked about okay, earlier in this unit, um, where I look at all the sa land sales and you search for the term tea to see what, you know, what pieces of land had tea gardens on them. And then you see what else they had. And you see very often they also had rice paddies. They also had you know, dry fields that were doing, growing other things besides tea. So the farmers, they diversified their risk. Okay, tea was a good option for them, but they didn't dare you know, specialize in tea. So these were non-specialists. They would grow the tea. They'd grow the plants that fertilize them. Four times a year, the tea leaves had to be picked. Okay, they would call in local women. And I don't think these local women were really specialists themselves. They were probably doing a lot of different things in the countryside, but they would come in and pick tea when they could make a little money doing so. Once the tea is picked, the farmer, he does some basic processing so that the leaves don't spoil. And then the tea moves on into the hands of middlemen. Sometimes maybe it passes through the hand of one middleman. It could pass through the hands of several middlemen. The middlemen, they were important to the tea industry in Taiwan. And they're important in, usually in industries where you have many, many small enterprises that you know, need to work with other small enterprises. You've got to have people that will kind of help, help do the matching. Well, one of the things these middlemen did was sorting. Um, my colleague, Gu Weiwen, she's written a paper about this in the Journal of Economic History, if you're interested in that. But she looked at what middlemen were doing. You know, she found it was very important for them to, to sort the tea, that you, know, you would get tea from one place, but you know, it may have been of good quality, but for it to really be good, you had to have a complementary tea kind of mixed in with it. So they were very good at kind of mixing the teas to, to raise the quality of the tea. They also did other things, though, like, you know, help them as financial agents, okay, to get finance to the farmers. Uh, they, I've already mentioned that they were in need of capital because tea is kind of a long-term investment. They also, you know, did transportation, okay, things like this. Eventually, the middlemen would sell the tea on to a tea factory. They'd usually sell the tea, I think, to one tea factory, but there was quite a few tea factories in Taiwan. They weren't extremely big and it was a very competitive industry. When a tea factory would buy the tea, okay, the tea had to be processed. Okay. There was several several steps to do in this process. One thing, you had to put the tea kind of in a furnace to get it fermented. And this was all this was also important when you were in floral teas and you try to get the scent into the tea. These men are you know almost undressed state. That's because they work in the furnaces. Often what they would have to do is they'd have to get some sort of towel, you know, put it in cold water and wrap it around their head to keep from fainting in the heat. They would put the tea in the furnaces, helping it to ferment. They would have to run in there and kind of stir up the tea. Okay. So you have to get the, the tea fermented at the, the right level for the market. It's also important to pick through the tea to get rid of all the trash. When you use floral teas, you also have to get rid of all the flowers. And most of the laborers in the, the tea factories were probably women, along with children. Okay, they, they were people that didn't need lots of strength. They mainly needed dexterous fingers to, to go through and quickly get the trash out of the tea. Okay, so if you went through um, Da Dao Cheng, 
in the late Qing Dynasty, um, when the tea harvest was being processed, you walk down the road outside of all these tea factories, you would often see many tables, many women and children sitting around, and they're picking through the tea. Okay, once the tea is finally, you know, produced, it's ready to market, you have to sell it abroad. Okay? And now it usually goes through the hands of foreigners. The okay, Westerners who understand the Western market, in particular uh, the American market. Now if it's Baozhong tea, then you're more likely, I guess, to, to go through the hands of Chinese merchants. But that's a different company usually. Sometimes you might have some integration where the exporter makes some of his own tea. But you, often the tea is bought from manufacturers. The exporter does the quality control, makes sure this is the quality we want. Okay. They box the tea, and they have these boxes, they're lined with lead. Okay, and the tea then is shipped off the market. So you know your, the tea goes through probably the hands of you know four, five, six okay different businesses um, along the way to finally reach the American market. So that's basically what the tea industry is like in Taiwan. And as I mentioned, you know all the farmers. There's lots of farmers. There's lots of middlemen. Okay, there's lots of factories. And there's probably at least a dozen exporters. India, British India, does things somewhat differently. Of course, you got to grow the tea. Here's you know a tea field where the, the women are there picking the tea. That looks very much like Taiwan. A difference would be that in the tea plantations in India, there's much more specialization. The tea plantations generally were, you know, mainly just planting tea. Okay, they, they might plant a little food to be self-sufficient, but it was mainly, uh, tea plantations were mainly just tea, tea growers. And they were usually a much larger scale than what you would find in Taiwan. Then you would go in, there wouldn't be middlemen, okay, the factory would process its own tea. And here again you see women kind of picking through the tea leaves. Okay, now this is done inside. Probably this is an indication that the, the British industry is more capital intensive. You know, they they got the money to build a, a big factory. So, you know, if it rains or something, they don't have to worry about the, the women working outside. Um, so, you know, they have to do the same thing, though. They have to pick through, get the trash out. And this is an integrated operation. You see here the tea fields come right up to the tea factory. Okay, these, these things, they, they work, they're, they're, they're right together. And then this is a, a, a big tea plantation. Okay, you're looking at it from, from the hillside. Okay, you see a lot of little houses. Probably these houses are often the houses where the workers live. The bigger buildings, those probably have to do with the factories mainly. What I really want to notice here though is if you focus in kind of in the middle of the frame, you can see two things here. More in the front, you can see wagons. The factory had lots of wagons. They look like covered wagons. They would go out in the fields and you all know, bring in the tea. Okay, so this is something that wasn't usually done in Taiwan. In Taiwan, the, the tea was often just you know, carried by coolies. This is, you know, they, they had more capital. They could invest in this sort of thing. But what's most interesting is so you look behind that. What do you see there? Those are rail cars. They started using light rails in British India, and, and that would move the tea around fast. Okay, they could get it into the factory you know, very, very quickly and then get it you know, from the factory to market. So some of these factories were, I mean, these plantations were large enough, they would actually invest in, in light rail systems. Okay. So if everything was done on a bigger scale in, in, in British India. So scale economies, that's one way the British can beat out the Taiwanese. Okay. They can do everything on a big scale, and this allows them to overcome some fixed costs. Okay. They integrated production. Okay, so the, the, the growing of the tea and the manufacture of the tea and the export of the tea was often done by the same, you know, same person or the, you know, the same business. And because they had a, you know, a big integrated operation, they had some, you know, some reputation to uphold. And they would be very much into quality control. Now, if you're a really little person, like in Taiwan, you don't really have much in the way of a reputation you can defend. Hey, if, if your tea is going to be thrown in with all the other tea, okay, and, and mixed together, well, you know, if you can throw a little trash in there, you, you'll do that probably because, you know, that's the way you make a little extra money. 
and you know, no one's going to know who did it. There's just so many companies out there. If some middleman catches you cheating, well, you'll just work with another middleman next time. Okay, everybody does it. And, and you know, once it gets to the factories too, these, you have a quality inspection for exports. Okay, but there's always a challenge. That there's so many factories working and it's very competitive. They're trying to make a little extra money. Um, so the quality was always, you know, it's very hard to keep the quality up really high. Okay. British India usually is, is, you know, one big operation. They've got their name that's going to, you know, determine how much their tea will be sold for in the marketplace once it gets into Great Britain. Okay. They often work very hard to maintain this, the quality control okay, and, and to maintain their brand. One other thing that helps British India and gives them an advantage is they use indentured labor. Indentured labor is, is pretty controversial. Okay? There, was, there was actually in the United States early on before independence, um, you know, people came over under indentured contracts into the United States. You know, indentured basically is, you know, means that if you're being sent someplace um, to work, well, they don't want you to go there and just immediately quit, okay, because they're going to probably have to pay for your boat ticket or whatever. So you often have to sign a long-term contract to say you'll work at least for a certain amount of time. Okay. In British India, what they did is they would go through, they would try to find people in populated areas that were having a hard time finding you no know, full-time work. Maybe they were you know, women that were unhappy in their family life. Um, you know, maybe it was somebody that just you know, was, was struggling in their community. They would try to get them to sign these indentured con labor contracts. They would sign up. Often the contract would require them to work, you know, maybe, I don't know, a certain number of years. Okay. Then they would be shipped off to the plantation. The plantations were located in more in outlying areas. They didn't use local labor. They relied on indentured labor. And it was labor that was easy to control and also easy to push. You know, because these people were away from home. Um, they had signed contracts that they couldn't just quit if you, you know, if you abuse them. And so, you know, sometimes these, these indentures, they're, they're not always bad things, but um, they're easily abused. And so this may be one way that British India kind of managed to get ahead of Taiwan by using indentured labor. In Taiwan, you know, people basically were free to quit whenever they wanted. You know, and they, they tended to not specialize, you know, too much so that they could, you know, change jobs if they needed to. So... This is how India managed to push people like Taiwan and China okay, out of the tea business. When Japan took over Taiwan, they didn't really like the way the Taiwanese ran their, their tea industry in many ways. Throughout the Japanese period, tea largely remains in Taiwanese hands. It's a Taiwanese industry, and it's being sold usually to, to either the Chinese people in Southeast Asia or to the West. Okay, so often this is being done by, you know, non-Japanese merchants. But the Japanese, they were, you know, very interested in, you know, Taiwan, their colony, making money. So they also invested a lot of time in trying to figure out how to improve this industry. One thing they did, which was probably useful, is they started doing a lot of advertising okay, and quality control. They, they started putting um, quality control stations where if you wanted to export tea, it had to not only go through the quality control of the private company, and you know, maybe that would have been enough. I don't know how important the Japanese quality control was, but you had to go through another layer. The, the Japanese government also had to okay your, your quality. And then once the quality was, was, you know, was acceptable, okay, you could export, they wanted to advertise how good their Taiwan tea was. Okay? Of course, they're also advertising their own green tea. Okay? But, but they also want Taiwan tea to succeed. Here you see Formosa tea, uh, a poster. Okay? One of the things the Japanese did is whenever there was some international exhibition, there would usually be a Formosa tea house. Okay? This is the Formosa tea house in San Francisco. I've seen also pictures of Formosa tea house in New York. Okay? There was a lot of world fairs during this period where you would see Formosa tea houses and they would let people taste the tea, try to convince them that this is the tea you want. Other things the Japanese tried didn't seem to work out as well. And as Professor Gu discusses, you know, they, the, the middlemen were important in Taiwan's industry. The Japanese really didn't see a need for these middlemen. And really, throughout, well, throughout history, a lot of 
um, critics um, have, have criticized middlemen. They've seen them as parasites. You know, they're, they're people just kind of in the middle that try to skim off a little bit of the profit. If we get rid of that middleman, you know, we can split the profit ourselves. Okay, so let's get rid of the middleman. Okay, sometimes that makes sense, but usually middlemen exist for a reason. That's kind of what happens here. The Japanese tried to set up auction houses where farmers could bring their tea, the manufacturers could go look at the tea, and then there would be tea auctions, and you didn't have to have a middleman. These don't really work out though, okay? And this is what you know, Professor Gu finds out. She looks at these auction houses, she finds that this doesn't really raise the value of the tea, okay? Because the middlemen really were doing important services. And in the end, people still depend on these middlemen for most of Taiwan's tea production. Okay, so in this case, the Japanese were trying to make the market more efficient, overcome transaction costs, you know, transactions in the market. These aren't always as easy to do as we, we sometimes think in our models. So they were trying to make it easier to do transactions. In the end, they didn't succeed. Okay. Another thing they tried to do though was with this black tea. Now, again, they did this both in Taiwan and in Japan. Okay, both, both places they did the, basically the same thing. They tried to, to, to do what the English did. They tried to set up large-scale integrated production. And there were some areas of Taiwan where the Japanese bought large, you know, large areas of, of contiguous land. Okay. They actually would put in you know, hundreds of hectares of tea production. And then you know, that would all belong to one factory and it would all go to that factory. Okay, it wouldn't go through a middleman. They'd do it just like the, the British did. And how well did this work? Now what happens is that very quickly the Taiwanese start imitating them and start doing black tea too. The Taiwanese don't do it in this larger scale. And I think by, you know, by the you know, 1939, 1940, the Taiwanese had caught up and were producing at least as much tea as the big Japanese companies were. So I don't know if this really worked in Taiwan. It's hard to tell though, because you know, by 1939, there's the war, war is starting, and because of the war, everything kind of gets destroyed. This was an experiment that you know, we never really saw um, what's gonna, you know, what the final results were gonna be. So the Japanese, they, they had an idea more like you know, the British did. You know, they wanted to do things large scale. That's how Japan succeeded in many of their industries. They thought integration, vertical integration, was a good idea, and they would try to do this in, in Taiwan. Sometimes they were successful, but often the Taiwanese succeeded doing things their own way. So, you know, comparing these things, you know, Taiwan's, you know, these small oolong producers, they eventually do lose out to the British producers. Okay? So the British had these economies of scale that allows them to do branding, they do better quality control. They probably get to do better advertising because they've got you know big companies. You know, they eventually push the Taiwanese out of the, not completely out of the American market, but kind of into a corner of the American market. Okay, they they take over. Um, so the Taiwanese they had this weakness. Okay, they weren't you know they, they had to face these big integrated producers. They didn't have scale, and whenever scale economies were important and vertical integration was important, Taiwanese tended to, to get pushed out of the market. Okay. What the Taiwanese did do, though, then, is, you know, I talked about the Baljong tea. Well, the Taiwanese, they noted what the British were doing. These big-scale British companies, they were also investing in new machinery. Okay? If you're big, you can do more research and development. You know, a small person doesn't have the money for that. And if they discover something new, other people will, will, you know, will find out what they're doing really quickly and probably the invention will spread and they won't get themselves, they won't get a lot of the good out of that invention. Much of the good of that invention will go to other producers and will go to the consumers. Big British companies though, they each have a big part of the market. They're more likely to do research and development. And they were coming up with, with ways of mechanizing uh, a lot of the tea production. The Taiwanese are aware of this. And they start using more and more sophisticated equipment, the kind of the equipment the British were using. But then they they aim at the smaller niche markets that the, the Japanese were not aiming, I mean, the, the British were not aiming at. And in particularly, they use kind of some of the simple British, new British production methods to make the Baljong Cha, and they can make that better, and they could move into the markets in Southeast Asia and in China. 
what's special about Taiwanese is that, that you know there's there's very many of them, okay, and so you know they're they're always looking around for for some new niche to get into, and you find that Taiwanese are very good in the niche markets, okay? and you can understand this with many small producers, okay. When you think of it, it's, it's very close to say a, a you know perfectly competitive market. Perfectly competitive markets, you're much more likely to see type networking to get information. If you're in a market that's kind of an oligopoly, you know you imagine say two big producers, they're not going to share information much. And every dollar that one producer makes is a dollar less the other producer is going to make, and they're going to be very jealous. If you've got you know a thousand small enterprises. Well, you know, if another enterprise, your next door neighbor, he does well, that doesn't really hurt you. Okay, he's going to get a little more of the market, but that market's divided among a thousand people. So, you know, if you've got some information, you know, you're willing to, to share it with him if he'll take his information and share it with you. Okay, you're willing to do these networks, okay, because these people aren't really directly competing with you. There's just so many competitors, okay, that, that you know, you don't worry too much about this competitor getting a little bit of an advantage. Okay, he's just a small guy anyway, just like you. Okay. So what you see in Taiwanese businesses is information flows are pretty quick. Okay. Individually, there's probably not many companies doing research and development because they're such small companies. But if something new does come along, someone hears about, maybe something the British have done, something the Japanese have done, well, that information spreads to the network very quickly. And everybody kind of swarms and, and and, and does that, you know, that usually does that, you know, finds that new market or, or uses that new technique. So that's one of the ways Taiwanese have been very successful, okay, swarming onto these new um, opportunities. If it's a big opportunity, then they're probably going to be pushed out of that market pretty quickly by some big player, okay, from, from Britain or Japan or wherever, okay. What the Taiwanese have done over time very well is moving into to niche markets. And Taiwan is small enough, a niche market is plenty big for a lot of people to make money. Okay. What you find in Taiwan, and I, I've looked at, um, again, in, in United States customs um, statistics, sometimes they break down the statistics very finely. Okay, so maybe you've got 10,000 different categories of imports to the United States. And then you look at total imports, and you look at Taiwanese imports, you know, the imports coming from Taiwan. And you look at what is the comparative advantage of Taiwan. And Taiwan has one very clear comparative advantage, and that's always in the other category. Okay, so you look through almost any section, it doesn't matter if you're looking at clothing, you're looking at machinery, okay, whatever you're looking at. You know, there's all these different categories, and Taiwan's going to be there sometimes a lot, sometimes a little. But it seems like the biggest category for Taiwan is always when you get down to other, and then you see that's the place where the Taiwanese have proportionally the, the largest amount of imports coming into the United States that are coming from Taiwan. Okay. Why would this be? Well, other is either small niches, or, you know, you don't really, they're so small that they don't want to really give them a category by themselves. And the Taiwanese are really good at moving into these small niches. Sometimes other also includes new niches, okay, new sorts of products that haven't got their own category yet. And Taiwanese are always fast to move into that too. So that's one of the comparative advantages of Taiwan that aren't explained by very by simple economic models is that Taiwanese are always best at the other market, okay, the other category. Now Taiwanese though do have their weaknesses, okay. Um, they often needed foreign help for quality control and for branding, and this continues to this very day. Okay, though um, things are changing somewhat, but you, 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 it's still it's still an important limitation on Taiwan. Okay? Um, so in the tea industry, it was the Japanese that did quality control. When we look later on at the other agricultural exports, usually the Japanese there were also doing quality control when Taiwan was a Japanese colony. When it wasn't a Japanese colony. Often it was the, the foreign exporters, you know, like the foreign companies that were exporting the tea to the United States, they would do the quality control. You know, later on, in the 1960s and 70s, when you had the big consumer export boom, then too you've got 
Western companies and Japanese trading company work as middlemen. And one of the things they're doing is they're doing quality control, trying to, to make sure that, the, that all these small Taiwanese producers are not cheating too much, you know, that they're, they're turning out goods that are, that are good enough for the market. So what we see in the tea industry is very similar to what we are going to see in many of the other industries that turn out to be very successful in Taiwan. Okay. When we go on and look at, say, the consumer exports after World War II, again, this is done often in, a, in industries that are not very integrated. Often the, the goods move through the hands of many different businessmen. They're from small enterprises. Okay. The Taiwanese are very quick to produce what's needed. And then they're usually sold through some foreign intermediary who does the quality control. And, you know, when we get into electronics, we'll also see quite a bit of this. Okay? Um, this is just the way Taiwanese production has generally worked through the 20th century, though we'll also be looking at some notable exceptions to this.